Thank you, thank you, Phil. Um, welcome to Georgia, y'all. Uh, I'm a proud Georgia resident. I'm really excited about what's going on here with Security Onion Con and B-Sides tomorrow. Uh, this is my third year attending Security Onion Con and uh, it gets better every year. Uh, and I don't think this is gonna be uh, really an exception. So I was really excited to hear that I got the talk uh, right before lunch uh, because, in my opinion, a lot of people hate it because it's the worst slot because everybody wants to get to lunch. But I feel really empowered by the fact that I am now the only thing standing between you and delicious barbecue. <laughs> and I would never do anything to abuse my power uh, <laughs> and make you hungry or want to leave this talk. Um, never in my wildest dreams would I do such a thing. Man, that looks good. We are in the barbecue capital of the world, just in case there was any doubt. Um, if anybody's from North Carolina, y'all can just deal with it. <laughs> um, Phil gave me a good enough introduction. I'm not going to harp too much on, on about me. You can read that in the program, but I will talk just briefly about the Rural Technology Fund. Uh, among all the things on here, it's the thing I'm the most proud of. Uh, started about eight years ago. Uh, we take uh, rural areas, um, like those not far from here, like those uh, in western Kentucky where I'm from, uh, provide them with technology equipment for their classrooms uh, to get people interested in computer security, uh, computer science, things of that nature. Uh, we do that on the individual student level by providing scholarships to those students in those areas who may not have other opportunities. And we also donate uh, the equipment to the classrooms, as I said. Um, this year, we're on track, uh, God willing, to be able to donate um, 10 $5,000 maker spaces to 10 rural schools across the country. Um, and I'm incredibly excited about that. If you want to learn more, uh, If you want to learn more, it's ruletechfund.org. Talk to me later. There's a lot of ways uh, people can get involved and uh, and help. Can I interrupt you for a second? Is your mic on? Yeah, you might want to put it a little closer. Put it down here. Check, check. Put it down on your shirt. Look right here. Yeah. Better? Yeah. 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 Microphones are hard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the agenda for today. Um, you see what's on the thing? I like to, uh, I want every one of my presentations to be a story, and if this one had a plot, uh, it's more or less talking about why investigations are important. I'm gonna start there. And then lessons I've learned from investigating the investigator um, that can make you a better investigator. I'll say that three times fast. <laughs> So that's what we're going to go through. I've got a lot of slides. I've probably got an hour and 30 minutes worth of slides for a 45 minute talk, so we'll just get right into it here. Um, first and foremost, um, I'm a big believer that uh, security is an economic problem. I had a really great professor uh, at the college I went to at Murray State University named uh, Dr. Tafiq Rashid, and he said this quote here that really stuck with me, and I've remembered it ever since I was in college. And he said, if you want to understand the world of nature, master physics. If you want to understand the world of man, master economics. And I'm not nearly smart enough to master economics, but I do know enough about economics to realize a lot of the problems we face in security today are ones uh, founded in an economic nature particularly the fact that the uh, number one rule of economics is, is this whole supply and demand thing, the seesaw. Mm -hmm. We have a great demand for security professionals and not nearly enough of a supply of them. That's one of the reasons I'm doing the Rural Technology Fund is we need a greater supply. Now, that's the problem. The side effect, as you see, is that when expertise costs so much, it drives up the cost of everything else, right? And that's why only your Fortune 500s can really afford to play the game and hire enough people to do security really properly in a lot of cases. Your little guys are really not enabled to do that really well, and that's a problem. So when your people cost more, your services cost more, and your products cost more, and it's a bad situation for everybody. <laughs> the old mantra is, is you want to increase the cost of attacking your network for the attacker. Flip side of that is you want to decrease the cost for the defender, and when those are really highly imbalanced, you're going to have a bad day, right? So that's, that's what I think a lot of the problem is. <clears throat> now, when you think about the evolution of network security monitoring, and I've, I've presented this, this before, I generally think it's kind of evolved in three primary steps, right? 10 to 20 years ago, we were in this era of detection where people realized they could watch the network and find bad things happening. And that was great. Everybody loved it. Networks were small. Put snort on it. It's your main egress point. Capture all the traffic. You're having a good time. Capture as much traffic as possible. And that worked great until networks got much bigger and much faster and attacks got a lot more diverse and it didn't work so well. Um, a lot of companies are still kind of in this detection era. I think most people fall in the collection era, which is where I think most people are right now. And it's generally a sense of, I need to be smarter about what data I'm collecting, 
what I'm looking for, where I'm looking at it. I'm not just gonna collect everything at the egress point. I'm going to map where my sensitive assets are, collect things uh, at the choke points above those, maybe start there, start thinking about risk and mapping that to uh, what I'm collecting uh, and building my detection strategy around that. So it's being smarter about it. Now, a lot of people are moving into this third era, and that's where I think we're really kind of just broaching now, and this is this analysis era. This is the part where we have really good collection, we're collecting really efficiently or really quickly. We have really good detection in a lot of ways, but what happens after the alert is generated? When you have an analyst with hands on keyboard, what does he do? And part of the big economic problem is when you're paying these analysts a whole lot of money and they're not very efficient at taking the alert and getting to a resolution, it only expands the economic problem. And we're in a situation right now where security is kind of this nascent profession. And even the folks who are really, really good at it are not good at explaining why they're good at it. I happen to work with a lot of really, really great analysts. And if you ask them, how did you figure out this bad thing led to this other bad thing? They can't always tell you why, right? They can tell you, well, here's the data, here's what the attacker did, but they can't tell you how they got to that answer. Right? And that's a problem. That's a huge problem when we're in a field and the knowledge is all so tacit. How are we supposed to train people to be good analysts when we can't necessarily explain how we as experts do it? And I'm looking at a whole bunch of experts right now, and I think if you all kind of ask yourself how I do some of the things I do, you might have a really hard time explaining it. And that's a bit of a problem. <clears throat> now, the good thing is that problem is not necessarily unique to us. Right? Every thought-based profession kind of goes to this, this point in time where they realize they're not good at thinking about thinking. We call it metacognition. They're not good at uh, understanding metacognition and how they think about the big challenges um, in their industry, right? Um, I put on here that ours is coming, that our cognitive revolution, our cognitive crisis is kind of coming. And uh, I, I think it's here, quite honestly, for many people. And for those who haven't experienced that, they soon will. Now. Uh, Cognitive crisis, as I was thinking about that, well, if I'm going to say we're in a cognitive crisis, what necessarily constitute a cognitive crisis and how can we apply it to other things? Well, first of all, demand for expertise greatly outweighs supply. I've already talked about that. I think most of us can kind of relate to that in some way. Whether you're an analyst and your, uh, uh, your inbox is filling up with uh, recruiter emails all day long, or whether you're a hiring manager uh, and you just can't find enough smart, talented people, right? We can all relate to that to some degree. Uh, number two is that most information cannot be trusted or validated, right? Nothing in our field is really done very scientifically. Anybody can make something kind of work once, post it on a blog, and then a lot of people take it at the gospel without actually validating it more or even having the data to validate it. We're not really good at making reproducible things uh, in a lot of ways uh, in the industry, especially on the defensive side. So that's an issue. <laughs> Inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic problems, right? The one that comes to mind right now is ransomware, right? Ransomware is probably the biggest problem most of your little guys are facing. Uh, you know, I read an article, uh, uh, a place not too far from my hometown in Kentucky, a hospital uh, where the hospital employs more than 50% of the entire community, and they got hit with ransomware and had to pay it, and the amount they had to pay was equal to basically a salary position, right? And that's, that has long-term tangible impacts on these communities. So uh, we've not been really good at dealing with things like that, right? Ransomware is the latest example. Think of uh, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. We had all the different worm outbreaks, how long it took to get some of those contained. Uh, if you fire up a, a honeypot outside your network firewall, you're still going to see configure floating around, right? Like these things, these big systemic things, we're not good at mobilizing and tackling those. So those are kind of the, the three things that I labeled as kind of symptoms of a cognitive crisis. Uh, and I, I wanted to find examples of this in other fields, and the one that came to mind most is medicine. Uh, my wife happens to be a family medicine doctor, so I have a lot of access to physicians, and I talk to them about these things. And I went to them and laid out these three things, and they said, let's, let's have a conversation about the history of medicine, how these things apply. And they, their response was basically, yes, this describes medicine. They don't know anything about InfoSec, of course, but like, yes, this describes medicine exactly, right? Think about the state of medicine 100 years ago. Um, the demand for expertise greatly outweighed supply. You may have to uh, go 100 miles down the road to even find a doctor, right? And small communities just didn't have doctors at all. Uh, most information cannot be trusted or validated because there was no scientific method that was really employed uh, kind of in a systematic manner. There were no medical journals, things of that nature. Uh, that's where you get into cases where people would say, if you had an ulcer, you should drink milk because that will make it better. Of course, we now know, uh, actually only as recently as maybe 20 years ago, that milk actually makes ulcers worse. Right? And those things are, are going on all the time. Uh, and then the inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic issues. And that's where your, your plagues and your big disease outbreaks come out. And uh, you know, 
back in those days, Black Plague, things like that, that's why a third of Europe gets killed is because there's no way to mobilize and handle these big systemic issues, right? So the same thing that's happening here is happening in other fields. So what do you do about it? Well, the first thing you kind of really do is have to realize if you have a cognitive crisis, you need to have a cognitive revolution, so to speak. Uh, you need to better understand, as I said, metacognition and thinking about how you think. And I think there's three main things you can do there. Uh, number one is to understand the process used to perform uh, investigations and draw conclusions. Uh, you have to be able to study the investigative process. From there, there's two other things you can do. Develop repeatable methods and develop training. Um, we really got to start with the first one, right? And that's what the rest of this talk about is really that first one is understanding the investigation process. <laughs> Now, an investigation, I really, and this is kind of where the name of the talk comes from, is kind of a labyrinth, right? You're presented with a piece of information, you make a decision. I'm going to do this, I'm gonna look at this. From there, you make another decision. And this just spans out, you made all these decisions and every previous decision affects the next one. So, the bad part is the defender in a, in a labyrinth, right? Eventually you get to the, the, the leprechaun in the middle or you escape from it or, or whatever you're gonna do. Um, and you know, what, you know what you're doing is the right thing. As a defender, we often don't know, right? If we are investigating something, we really think it's nothing. It may be a while before we know if we're wrong and it may be when the name of our company is on, plastered on CNN or something right, like that and that's, that's not fun for anybody. <coughs> so uh, it's definitely a bit of a maze. And it gets even more so when you picture the fact that, I mean, Look, just look at all these different options. These are all just different types of data you can go to when you have a very simple input, right? And, and you can investigate a hostile host, start with the network data, move to the host data, look at PCAP, look at Windows security logs. There's just so many ways um, to go. So how do you study this, right? That's the biggest problem. How do you study how an investigator approaches these types of things? So that's what I set out to look at. Now, my two main goals were with an analyst, right? We want to be cost effective, and the way you do that is you increase accuracy and you decrease the time it takes to investigate things. One of the reasons we have an economic problem with analysis is it takes a long time to investigate anything, even for the experts in a lot of cases. We want to get past that. So how do you study human thought? Um, so what I wanted to do was create an investigate, a way to study investigations that was tool independent, right? Because the prob another problem with investigation is everybody learns it through the lens of whatever tool they have. If you use ArcSight, you're going to learn how to investigate through the lens of ArcSight, right? And there's good things and bad things about that, right? But the fact of the matter is not everybody has ArcSight. And if you're learning through one specific lens instead of a more generalized, broader lens of how an investigation should work, you're pretty much handicapping yourself, especially when that tool is no longer available to you. So I did this, so I said I want to have a scenario based approach to investigation analysis that was completely tool agnostic so I could study these things. I needed it to be portable and self-contained and I needed to be able to see it with all kinds of investigation scenarios so I could study this in a scientific manner by changing one variable at a time, giving this to analysts, seeing how they do things and seeing how those variables uh, change the results, independent and dependent variables, right? Science. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so basically, um, that's what I did, and what I built uh, ended up looking really more like a game than anything else, so that's, that's what I did. I sat out and I built this, uh, and I'm gonna, I want to actually show you this, but I'm going to need a volunteer, so I'm going to ask my good friend Alec Rollison to come up. He's in the back. Alec, is, Alec works with me. He's one of the smartest guys I know, but nobody's perfect. He's an Ohio State fan. <laughs> And he's not about to come down to SEC country as an Ohio State fan and not get called out on it. Oh, wait. I don't. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand Alec this microphone. And I'm going to switch over to this. Uh, I may drag that somewhere. Can't see my mouse. <laughs> Can't see your mouse either. A little bit. There you go. Right there? Right there. Teamwork. All right. So I have a pretty basic simulation here, and I've loaded this with a scenario. <laughs> And Alex is going to work through it for us here. Um, as you can see, we have a Circon alert. Uh, there's a piece of malware called FY3 that's been downloaded here. Very simple signature. Uh, just looking for the download of, of FY3.exe. And we have all these different data sources available to you. So um, I'm going to ask Alec uh, what, uh, what data source he would like to investigate. Let's check out the alert data. Let's check out the alert data. 
So there's the alert data. Now we see, um, <coughs> we see this is an alert packet that tripped this. We see a, a friendly host. Now it's very simple, all easy to, to remember IP addresses just for the, the sake of the exercise. So 10.10.10.10 .10 .10 .10 is the, is the, uh, the internal host. 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 is the uh, external host. Um, <coughs> not real IP addresses, don't connect to them, et cetera. Um, <laughs> So there's a git request for slash dash slash fy3.exe. It was uh, referred to from barbecuesupplies.com slash robes.php, not a real website. Uh, and the host was freemachinelearning.com, also not a real website yet. <laughs> so tell me when you're ready to move on and you're gonna look at a different data source. Yeah, let's go ahead and change your PCAP. PCAP. Okay, what, uh, what host did you wanna pull the PCAP for? Uh, the 10, 10, 10, 10. Okay. So we've got uh, two conversations. Only one is on the screen right here. Um, and it's the only one that really matters for this purpose. So I'm just going to leave that there. <clears throat> so we see here, we've got the get request. We've got an HTTP OK. Uh, and we've got a file that was downloaded. For simplicity, it just calls the MD5 of it just file one. So that's the, that's the signifier of the file. What next? Well, let's check out some OSINT for that MD5. Okay. We have OSINT information. Uh, file hash, okay. So we just called it file one. Yeah. So it looks like the file hash was found uh, on virus total 40 to 42 detections. It's the FY3 adware. So it does look like it's malicious, or at least it's adware. Let's go ahead and pull some AV logs for that post. AV logs, okay. Seven. Okay, we have an AV log for this host, and it looks like uh, uh, the malware was detected. It was uh, and then deleted. So, very likely, would you say that uh, the host did probably did not get infected? Correct. Okay. So let's go ahead and finalize this thing. Um, we're going to say no no infection occurred. Skip through some things, and sure enough, um, you report the incident did not occur, and this simulator an incident did not occur, and that's that. So everyone give Alec a round of applause here. So. Cool, so that was basically the investigation simulator. Very simple, a lot of really poorly written Python code that allowed all that to happen. Um, thank you to the demo gods for allowing me to have a successful demo that was not just a demo, <laughs> but a demo of my own code which never goes well. So basically what I did is I took that investigation simulator and I had lots of people run through it. Basically my entire team, because I, I, could, I had the power to make them do that, uh, <laughs> uh, as well as a whole bunch of other folks, uh, some of you in this room for sure. So that was one of my main data sources. Uh, I also did some case studies. Many of you saw this blog post. Some of you in here participated in it, where I talked to investigators, did a case study of specific cases they were involved with, did some key phrase analysis. Uh, I did some Twitter polls. Twitter's great for polling. This is some of my finer work uh, in terms of Twitter polling. Uh, uh, and of course, I work for the All Seeking Fire Eye, so I have access to a lot of really smart people. Uh, and I talked to um, a lot of those guys and got their opinions and, and utilized their expertise in some of this research. So for what little time I have left here, I'm going to talk about um, basically that research and some of the findings. Um, it's worth noting in this case, the compromise I did was not the scenario you just saw that was used in some of these, but the main one looked like this. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's a very uh, common exploit kit type infection where you go to a site that's legit, get redirected to a malicious site, pull down some bad stuff that pulls that it exploits something and pulls down some more bad stuff, et cetera, ransomware happens, C2 happens, and so on. Not important, really. So, and this is where I want some audience participation. Everybody raise your hand for me real quick. Get limbered up here. Okay, put them all down. Everybody's, everybody's really ready for lunch, I can tell. Uh, so what, what, what data did an analyst look at first? Um, so I'll tell you, there were three things, and you saw the different data types there. There were three things that really were only, only anybody ever looked at first. They were uh, packet capture, uh, OSINT data, and flow data. Raise your hands, who, think, uh, who thought thinks OSINT data was looked at more? First, or first, just a couple. Who thinks uh, flow data was looked at first? A few, and PCAP? Yeah, so, 
that's a pretty good, uh, that was about a pretty even distribution compared to what I actually saw. 72% looked at PCAP and the, the rest was divided between the other two. Uh, now that's not too surprising to me. What was interesting was I took this question and I did a poll, uh, both internally, it was the folks in FireEye uh, and externally on Twitter. And the, diff the reported, uh, what people said they would look at, given a generic uh, type of investigation, was a little distributed a lot differently. So a lot of people said they would look at, uh, uh, at PCAP or, or at these other things first, but they actually still resorted to PCAP with it being uh, available. So that, that has suggested a few things. I don't call them conclusions because I don't think it's super conclusive, but I think they do suggest <laughs> that, uh, of course, analysts prefer a higher context data set, not revolutionary. Um, and that's even if other data sets are available and even if lower context context data sets can lead to a resolution. Scenario was designed such that you could look at, you didn't have to look at the PCAP to solve the problem and come to a conclusion uh, in the case of this investigation, right? Um, and then the last one, of course, as I've stated before, analysts don't fully understand their own techniques because they're oftentimes reporting things that are not, ne not necessarily in sync with what they do in practice. <clears throat> so did the, uh, did the first move affect uh, analysis speed. So based on what they chose first, did it affect how fast they got from initial alert to alert closure? Who says yes? It's a pretty good guess or why would I have the slide, right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> so yes, so average time to close in minutes was notably higher for people who started with PCAP first. That's interesting, right? We all love PCAP, but Maybe not the most efficient, maybe. Um, so I went ahead and weighted this too. I mean, with the investigation simulator, you had just as easy access to any data source. Whereas in reality, if you're looking at PCAP, it's gonna take you longer to look at that because you have to go out and get it, filter it, pull it back down. Uh, it's gonna take you longer to look at PCAP than it is flow, and longer to look at flow than it is OSINT in a lot of cases. So I weighted these, and that really just kind of expanded and, and made the difference between the two even starker because PCAP takes longer to access and, and look at there. So that suggests uh, that while PCAP provides richer context, uh, it may slow down the investigation uh, if that's where you start, uh, which is kind of uh, similar to some of my experience anecdotally uh, and useful, uh, I think, as well. <clears throat> So another thing, so PCAP is very context rich, provides a lot of really good value. But what happens when you replace PCAP data with bro data, right? It's a lot of the same stuff, but it's organized a lot better, right? It takes out a lot of the stuff you really want to know. Um, so this is what we just talked about, what I observed with PCAP as far as first move. Like, what was your first move? <clears throat> with Bro, a lot less people looked at Bro when there was no, I took out PCAP, put Bro in its place, a lot less people looked at Bro data uh, right off the bat than they did with PCAP. So that's interesting. Now, um, how does that affect average time to close? Uh, so this is PCAP. So do you think when you look at Bro versus PCAP, did it increase or decrease your average time to close. Who says increase? Who says decrease? So that was about accurate. Pretty much evened out the time to close um, between flow and OSIN and between that being your first move. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, this isn't necessarily a commercial for Bro. I do love Bro, uh, but it's really more of speaking about how you can take a higher context data source and organize it much better for analyst consumption. And PCAP, while I love PCAP with all its context, is really inefficient in terms of being organized well for analyst consumption. There's just so much extraneous data there. Okay. So this one, what data sources were viewed the most and least frequently? Well, I think we can all guess from the previous slides that the PCAP was generally viewed uh, the most frequently. <clears throat> now the interesting thing I thought about this was, notice there are network stuff on the left and host stuff on the right. The scenario was designed so you didn't have to look at a single piece of network evidence to resolve it. You could look only at host-based data and resolve it. Yet, very few people looked at the host-based data. Virtually nobody started there, and very few people even would eventually pivot to it. Um, in some ways, you could have solved the investigation a lot faster had you started with host-based data, but people didn't. <clears throat> now, there may be a little selection bias in here. I, more of the people who took this, just based anecdotally on my knowledge of them, <clears throat> are more network-type analysts anyway, as opposed to like host-based forensicators. Um, so maybe that affected some of it. So I'm not willing to say this is perfect, perfect science, but uh, it's, it's something. Um, so I also plotted revisits. <laughs> this shouldn't be too big a surprise. So how many, based upon what data source did people have to go to at once and then come back to it to look at it a second time to get more information from it? Uh, your higher context data source here is really where that uh, seemed to play out most. So much data in PCAP, you can't remember it all. You look at it, you go look at something else, then you go back to the PCAP, right? Super inefficient. 
um, and it happens a lot here. So that suggests uh, many things. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay, how many steps were taken to make a disposition judgment? Um, so we had a lot of data available, a lot of different things you can do. So every time you pulled up a piece of data, I counted that as a step. And I said, uh, basically, uh, let's, let's group all those together. And I did some kind of almost arbitrary grouping. And this is the distribution of the number of steps uh, some of the analysts took with one of the scenarios I did. You see most of them were really between 11 and 20 with some folks on, on both ends of the spectrum, uh, kind of mirroring like a normal distribution to some degree. Now, the average time to close here was interesting. This one kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, so the, uh, particularly the fact that, uh, so the folks in the middle of the spectrum here kind of solved it about the same time. The folks over here solved it quicker, but not quite as quick as I thought they would. So they looked at much less data, uh, but they solved it maybe marginally quicker. Uh, and this is something that probably warrants a bit more investigation. <laughs> now, on the upside, or on this side here, uh, for the folks who looked at 21 to 25 pieces of data, including revisits to existing data, um, it took them significantly longer to resolve an issue. Um, and I will see anecdotally speaking, the folks I know who are analysts, uh, who are very entry level, most of them usually fell on this side. And it was a matter, I would surmise it's a matter of them not knowing what some of these data sources, what level of detail they could provide. So they're looking at basically everything. Um, and that's probably a big part of that, I would think. So that suggests the things I basically just said. Okay, another one. Did an analyst investigate friendly or hostile systems first, right? All of these involved a friendly IP address and a hostile IP address. So which one did they do first? Who says friendly? Who says hostile? About 50-50. Overwhelmingly, people chose to investigate the hostile IP address first. Overwhelmingly. <laughs> um, that, instead of friendly, that should say reported. So I did a Twitter poll, and basically the same thing I asked you, given a normal scenario, would you investigate friendly or hostile first? And most people said they would investigate uh, the hostile still, but it was 60-40. Great difference from this chart on the right. So um, <clears throat> I think what that suggests, anecdotally, from my experience, is that OSINT information is really easy to get. Like, it's very easy to go to VirusTotal and drop an IP address in or drop a domain in and so on. Learning information about your internal host is much harder because people don't build as many systems to collect that information. They don't have really good inventory systems. How many people are actually just going to pull a ton of PCAP or a ton of flow and look through a host? That it's a lot harder to do. So I think people have kind of been conditioned to look at uh, at the uh, potentially hostile host first. Plus, there's the whole element of mystery, right? Like it's this it's this thing that I don't control, so I'm going to assume it's bad and try to dig into that, right? So I think that has a little something uh, to do with it there. So this one's a little more nebulous. <laughs> when you have an alert, you really have two options. You can take that alert and do everything you can, look through evidence to try to prove that what they said happened actually happened, or you can try to disprove. You can say, ask questions and find answers such that I'm gonna try to disprove this so I know it didn't happen. Um, people overwhelmingly uh, sought to prove out their uh, hypothesis that an alert presents as opposed to disprove it. I thought that was pretty interesting, uh, <clears throat> particularly because the folks who chose to prove versus disprove, they took twice as long to solve it as those who disprove it. So the trick is with most investigations, not all of them, but most, if you have a way to disprove it, it's usually much quicker to disprove something than it is to prove it, right? Because you don't have to disprove it once. And if you, if you want to prove it, you may have to collect a whole wealth of evidence and look at all these different things. Did something download a flash exploit? where well, you could go look at all the stuff that might happen after that, or you can just look to see if the thing's running flash, right? Um, and I think we're actually, I have some extra stuff, we're actually going to wrap it up there. So I'll, uh, I'll, I don't want to hold you guys up for much too much, so I'll take questions after. If someone wants to find me, I'll be around. Um, but feel free, I'll take these slides and I'll post them. Uh, this is not always the best way to present super detailed data like this, um, but there's going to be an accompanying uh, blog post that actually puts this all out there, uh, including all the source data I have. So that's all going to be out there. So for those of you who want to validate, retry, do your own thing, it's all going to be out there uh, as well. So that's all I got. Thank you all.